You know, and as I was listening to a lot of the questions people had, um, I could see that a lot of people did have questions about management. Um, for the most part, and um, in the interest of your time, I'll, I will go through this pretty quickly, but you know, I'll be around for questions if you have any. This is the one that we're, we're typically dealing with. It's probably, the reason we're probably dealing with this one the most is because that's the one we see the most. We'd, if, we, if, snail, if slugs were this big, we'd probably be talking about slugs instead of the snails because we don't see the slugs that much. But um, you heard somebody mention that, you know, normal, until a few years ago, we would call the brown snail this helix aspersa. Um, now the accepted name is cornu aspersum. So you might hear that back and forth. We're slowly changing a lot of our publications to match the correct um, terminology, correct Latin name for that. Um, about this, this guard, excuse me, the, the brown garden snail, um, they've got a lot of problems. They, you know, obviously there's some questions about resistance. I'm still a little bit skeptical about that. Um, I think there's a lot of some other factors that are looking like resistance. But there's problems with the scouting. We had Jim Wynn talk, Jim Wynn talk about, you know, a lot of the, the cost of the production goes to scouting because you can't ship if they find snails and so forth. You've got to be really on, on the ball to get that. Um, then on top of the shipping, you know, I'll cover this a little bit later, it's cost efficacy. Um, there's just in maybe the past 10, 15 years, people are starting to look really closely at snail materials, how they're formulated, what the percent active is. You can buy metaldehyde, which is the most popular one, as we saw. Um, formulations from 1% to 7.5% um, active. What's in the bait, and I'll cover that a little bit. This is um, data that's a little bit old, but I think it's still, we still see it. This is how many pounds of active ingredient of metaldehyde, because that was the highest amount. I, I took the data off of DPR's pesticide use reports to see when most of the problems are. And obviously, people are baiting more when they see more snails. So looks like we, we start to ramp up in March. So now we get a big peak in April, um, kind of goes down a little bit, um, get another peak in August for whatever reason, and then we kind of, again, level off. But nevertheless, we're putting a lot of snail, snail bait out, with the exception of maybe January, and that's probably because it's, it's pretty chilly in that time of the year, and that's when the snails aren't particularly active. So for management of snails, again, maintaining a snail-free nursery, or you need to maintain areas that are clean, this is the things you got to do, is prevent the snails from entering from adjacent areas. Now, OK, so I actually started this as a joke. You know, say, hey, you know, you got a moat. That'll keep them out, so let's just dig a moat around your, your nursery or your area. Turns out that in Australia, they have a problem with the green snail. And one of their exclusion requirements, believe it or not, is to have a moat. Okay, and but, okay, it's not really a water-filled moat. You need to dig a trench around your area and then load that trench up with snail bait. Okay, I thought that was very interesting. So the snails can, can't get to that. No, they would encounter the snail bait before they get to your, the crop. Okay, and, and luckily, you know, be, being the last speaker, most of the other speakers have covered what I was going to talk about, but, you know, these are things that nurseries will do. They'll, they'll maintain that snail-free, or excuse me, that, that sort of holding area that's easier to inspect and keep it clean. And those are the kinds of areas where you can have a big buffer area or a big, or, or um, put copper banding, or you can put um, snail bait all around it and keep it clean. Always keep that debris out of the container prior to shipping. So, you know, and I have seen some trucks that, you know, once they pull the plants out, there's a lot of leaves and so forth on the bottom, and those leaves might be staying in that shipping, uh, in that truck. And now I have to say, I haven't seen this myself, but I have seen it in open air. You've turned that leaf over, and there's where you find a, some snails hiding in there. So you really need to clean out not just the containers, but you have to clean out all the debris on, from that container, okay? And also the pot itself, okay? Because you, you know that the Snails could be hiding under the leaves that might be on top of the, the container or something. And again, always inspect. So those are things that 
um, nurseries can do, obviously, to maintain. Now, having said that, you know, what kind of things can you do for exclusion? Uh, this is a tiny electrical fence, okay? And, and it's about four inches tall. It's really funny, about four or six inches tall. You can put it around your holding area. There's a nursery that I do some work with in Orange County. They have actually put up, so this is the electrical fence, okay? So the snails going across that, um, maintain, and it's actually called Slug Away, okay? It's really made for that. Or you can have copper fencing, okay? Copper, pretty expensive stuff. Um, you know, I'm sure if somebody knew that a nursery was surrounding their entire nursery, with copper fencing, that nursery, that um, nursery probably wouldn't have copper fencing for very long, from what I can see from people taking brass fittings and copper pipes um, from places that are in the open, much less one that is uh, relatively um, away from, from other sites where people can check it. But, if, but I do nur this nursery, okay, and if you, you recognize this map, you probably know what nursery that is. Um, has surrounded their entire nursery with that copper fencing you know, at, at a great expense. Okay, I'm not gonna really cover this um, because Jim Wynn has already covered it, but as far as applications, these are the kinds of things that one should do is the broadcast app um, applications. Don't need to pile it unless there's something specific like you do wanna do that trenching, but snails and slugs are typically attracted and the bait is much more effective when it is broadcast, and I'll, I'll cover that in, the, in a couple minutes. This is the examples of holding areas, okay? Um, I'm not a super big fan of putting things on the wooden benches because, you know, that's where a lot of times snails will go and hide during the day, um, unless you're using that as a trapping method or a way to monitor. Um, but, but that's how you would probably set up your holding area for those 30-day holds. What growers are doing right now, because they're so risk aversive, okay, and you really have to maintain that snail free, is you have that, that broadcast application of the baits three to four weeks. I think somebody, I think it was Arnold said something, like, and, and we have found that in our own work, is that most of these baits don't last longer than about 21 days. So um, because of that, you, you do have to have maintained continuous baiting in order to maintain good snail management. Excuse me. Um, using the, the copper tape plus baiting, you know, belts and suspenders kind of thing. Um, we have this picture where you could put copper, the wider bands on the benches, particularly wooden benches. Every time that an application is made, one should go look and scout. This is, again, that big expense. Scout for survivors, okay? Um, it's a very interesting paradigm working with bait because um, essentially, I'm sure you've seen the pellets, essentially it's one pellet per snail, okay? So if you've got 500 snails in an area, in a, you know, 100 square feet or something like that, that's a lot of snails, but let's just say 500, which is the sake of argument, and your rate of application turns out to be like um, 300 pellets, okay? That's gonna be 200 snails that aren't gonna have the opportunity to feast on that bait. So that's what, what you have to look at, okay? And then the other thing I just want to bring up is that measure all, the carbamate, really effective stuff, um, but only use that when it's in sort of an emergency as a cleanup or in spot spray, because there's a lot of restrictions with that. Okay, so um, controls. Right now, we have four good AIs registered. I mean, there's some other ones around that have snail and slug um, on the label, but these are the only ones I think at this time that really we can say are, are pretty consistently good. And I want to point out and, and um, might want to notice the table over there. This is a pretty new one, the sodium ferric EDTA, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. It's a lot like the iron phosphate, but because of that, and I'll, I'll actually I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Um, Decolate snails, I think that's only really a good site is maybe citrus nurseries. Um, don't use it in your own nursery because when some inspector comes and you say, well, how are you controlling your snails? I'm using decolate snails. I have a feeling that they're not going to really care that it's a decolate snail going to Oregon versus a brown snail. They're going to say, that's a snail, and so you got to get it out of there. Okay. 
Um, as far as metaldehyde, as I mentioned, those are the kinds of rates you can see. There are a couple of liquid formulations for the professional industry. Now, there's this paste that you can get that's more on the homeowner side. Um, but if you're going to do sprayable, there is the a metaldehyde sprayable, and there's and obviously the um, Measurol, which is methiocarb, it's a wettable powder. All right. So, so how do they work? Okay. Um, this is what was used a few years ago, so I haven't haven't updated, but I think it's still probably pretty good from what we've seen. Um, Looks to me like iron phosphate, just among this group, has increased the use. Um, Metaldehyde still the, the king with the number of pounds and the number of treatments used, okay? And I think, again, that's because in the snail-free shipping, you have to continually do an application, okay? And then the methiocarb, you really only use when you, when you absolutely need to because of the restrictions on the label, okay? Um, no more than two applications per crop per year. So you gotta really wanna use it. Um, metaldehyde, how's that work? A lot of people used to think, well, it, because they would see that foaming, they'd say, oh, but it's because the, there's something in it, it irritates the, the snail, the slug, and it starts you know, really foaming, and all the slime will come out, and then it dries up. And that's actually not what's going on. It's the, the cells that make the slime, okay, get destroyed. And rather than stop, than actually stop making mucus, they, they kind of just sort of over, over make it, and then they stop, okay? Um, in animals, mammals rather, okay, it's, it's a nerve poison, and there is an issue, even though most of the um, places that the, the companies that develop metaldehyde materials put a bittering agent in there so that it's not, so that even if a dog, for example, eats it, that the dog won't eat a lot, there are cases of um, dog poisoning that are actually verified. So that's, that's an issue that we need to um, think about. This is the kind of thing that one would see after a snail has eaten a metaldehyde baited materials. And it's very, very satisfying to see that, okay? It, it really is. You put it down, a couple hours, you might start seeing some of these. And definitely by, you put it in the morning, definitely by the evening when it gets a little bit moist out and so forth, you see it's excellent. Okay, um, like to, when it's moist out, you know, a lot of times we, we tell people if it's dry, you know, irrigate a little bit first, then put that bait down, really increase the effectiveness. Not so much the effectiveness of the bait, but it increases the possibility that a snail or slug will, will go out there and try to encounter that bait and then eat it, okay? Now, here's where I've, I've been trying to find out about this resistance issue or that plants or that these snails and slugs or generally snails, recover after eating metaldehyde. And now there's a lot of talk about that, but what I think the common field of knowledge now thinks that even if you don't see mold on these pellets, that there's probably is some, and that's a deterrent for the snail to eat it. And so it's not so much that um, they recover under moist conditions, but it's, they're just eating a sublethal dose because they taste the, the pellet and they go, bleh, okay, I'm not eating that anymore, I'm rather going to this lettuce, and, and they don't continue to eat it. So they might get a little bit affected by it, but they don't continue to eat that material because the actual, the actual, the actual bait part of it has gone bad, okay. All right, and then I, I believe Arnold had covered that, do get some mold, even though they say they're rain fast, we still see some, some of this type of, of damage. Okay, um, iron phosphate, the other one, so the sluggo type, okay? This one, metaldehyde doesn't necessarily have to be eaten. Okay, I just, I, I forgot to say that. If a snail or slug crawls across it, it can actually be taken up by that foot. Um, and so that actually sometimes is enough to, to manage those snails. As opposed to iron phosphate, it has to be eaten. Okay, the, it's the iron that's toxic, okay? then they stop feeding. So you don't see this. They're not, it's not quite so, so good to see. I mean, you like to see what's going on. What happens with snails that eat iron phosphate is that they eat it and they, they go away, like they go into their little room, close the door, and 
say, you know, don't, don't uh, you know, bother me for a few hours, and then they die. Okay, so you don't really find this nice pile of snails that, in the shells and say, oh yeah, this is really working. But it does, just slower, okay? Sometimes, you know, about a week to see, see it happening. But the good thing is, is they don't continue to feed. So they stop feeding almost immediately. So rather than looking for dead snails, you just have to see if the plants are protected, okay? Um, this is what, what happens. They, they just can't, can't, the crop, not, not the plant crop, but the, the, the animal's crop um, is damaged. Okay? And it's interesting, here's just a little bit of information about it. It is certified organic, okay? Um, so so um, you can use it and, and there's not as, as big a worker protection issues. Just some, some information, you know, I pulled off the line, off, off online, just comparing the activity of the iron phosphate, that's a sluggo, versus the metaldehyde types, um, deadline mini pellets, and durum 7.5%, versus the untreated control at different temperatures. Okay, so this is the you know, cool temperature. And, um, and keep in mind that I have a feeling that this, this um, work was, was sponsored by company that makes logo? I don't know for a fact, but I, I think it, I, I mean, I kind of remember something like that. Anyway, um, is that, so, so for, for whatever reason, they say that when it's cool temperatures that um, under, under cool temperatures that snails and slugs will recover more from metaldehyde type products than they will from the, the iron phosphate types. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. Okay, so, but I have heard a lot of people say that and it doesn't hurt, might help, make your switch over under the cool humid weather to use the sluggo material, okay? Um, the company says that, you know, this, this is what it looks like, okay? It looks like broken up pieces of spaghetti. They're very uniform, okay? Um, so, so the company says, you know, sometimes you don't want the blue pellets you know, if you're shipping and then your, your customers say, hey, what's all this pesticide in here? This kind of blends in better with the soil. On the other hand, I have seen some nurseries where the inspector goes out, uses something like this, or uses the metaldehyde that's sand-based, goes out and the inspector says, hey, I'm not gonna give you your um, certificate because you're not really baiting. And they're like, yeah, we're baiting all over the place. You know, you just can't see it. And they say, well, I can't see it. Where's all the blue, blue pellets, okay? So apparently in San Diego, they like to see the blue. Okay, new one. This one just came out, I think, 2012. Sodium ferric EDTA, that's the ferox, the slug, uh, slug X, iron fist, I think are some of the names that we have in, oh, here we go, in California um, for registered, 5%, 5% iron fist, uh, fist 2% active. Um, this one's interesting, okay? Um, probably has the same mode of action as the iron ET, EDT iron phosphate. Okay, let me get that right. Um, but, see, now this one is the active ingredient, sodium ferric EDTA. The EDTA keeps that iron in a soluble condition, so it, it's more available for uptake by, the, by these mollusks and consequently makes it more available for activity. Okay, so it's probably a, a much... Um, more, more active material, I guess, for lack of anything. Um, it's interesting is because apparently, I didn't know this until I started looking into it, snails and slugs have a copper-based um, circulatory system, kind of like Vulcans, if any of you are Star Trek fans. Um, so, a <laughs> bit of trivia on that. Um, so, it's very specific. So, crustaceans have the same copper-based um, circulatory system. And so, except for pill bugs and sow bugs, it doesn't really affect other organisms, okay? Because all of us, we have iron-based circulatory systems, if that is the mode of action, okay? So, just, so it is pretty specific for mollusks. Um, use, okay, five to 20 pounds per acre, unless you're using the one with the lower AI in there. So it's, it's um, a little bit lower 
actual you know, formulated material than you would have with metaldehyde or with the sluggo types. Okay. Um, okay. I move on to their our really hot one is the Measurol. That's a carbamate. Okay, we don't like carbamates. Very toxic to people. Okay, it, acetylcholinesterase inhibition. So you know this is the kind that you know, a lot of times you got to have a blood test. You know if you're working a lot with this kind of material, but works really really fast. Okay, you put it out. It's a spray. Put it out, and you can see quite good activity. Um, Many times I've, I've, a, a nursery can put it out, let's say the inspector comes out, finds the slugs, or snails rather, um, the nursery will say, okay, I'm going to lose my certificate unless I control them, let's, um, let's spray, and it, it works quite well. Very, very, um, oh, what's the word, consistent activity, okay? There is a bait. Okay, and a lot of people have said they like the bait. I can't find, it's still registered in California. I can't find anybody selling it, but I guess the registration is if you still have it, you can still use it. It's not available, it's not available but, but if you still have it, you can use it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I thought, but I still get a registration, so, you know. Um, all right, so, kind of covered a lot of this stuff. I'm just gonna kind of go through do this. Just want to point out there are a couple other ones. There's the Niban, which is boric acid. I found this kind of limited in its use as far as what, what, whether it works. I do want to make sure you all know about bait. Now, when I talk about bait, I mean that's the carrier for the active ingredient. Okay? So there's a lot of different baits that these active ingredients could, could conceivably be mixed with. Most of the time, it's wheat. Used to use apple pumice a lot. Of people love that. I don't know why they didn't. It might have been like a mold issue or something like that. Um, potato plus yeast is probably it's pretty getting popular, you know, or people are thinking about it. And bran plus molasses. But size of it, shape of it, that makes a big difference, especially the and, and depending on what kind of snail and slug you have, the size. Can you imagine a little amber snail trying to chew on a big chunk of? Um, sluggo or something like that might be a problem. Some research has shown that most of the time these animals are really attracted to, to the baits only within about a five millimeter distance. So when you're doing this application, you know, you want to make sure that you scatter it so that these pellets are only about five millimeters, so about a quarter of an inch away from each other. Um, because of that, some, play, some people say that we should be looking at smaller pellets, okay? because that way you can have them closer together, um, and then it's more likely that a snail or slug would be attracted to them. All right, um, not going to cover this just a little bit. We did cover um, some of this already. Um, this is very popular in citrus, works fantastic. Copper hydroxide mixed with the latex paint um, really ruins my snail collection efforts for my experiments when the, when the um, citrus grove that um, I was collecting them from, started painting their, their trees. In incredible. This is what you'll see with the brown snail. Okay, here, here's one laying eggs. Okay, so really bright white eggs when they're fresh. And this is where the cultivation comes in. Um, for that kind of snail, what we find is that cultivation really doesn't do that much for the snail itself, although I do kind of like that idea of the roller. Okay, going across a, an area because we do find the snails on top. But what happens is if you can cultivate to bring these eggs to the surface, they're very susceptible to drying out. So um, I see the snails pretty much laying tons of eggs this time of the year. And so this would be a time that one would want to probably go and try and cultivate a little bit. If, if you do have a high snail population, you are seeing them laying eggs, and, and you can see that. Um, that you come in there and scrape the soil surface or, or do a little bit of cultivation and break that part of the cycle. All right. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to cover that. But I do want to give you just a quick thing about how one can manage, have a system of mollusk management using different formulations. I know we all kind of just say, just give me... Um, a pallet of metaldehyde, and I'm just going to spread that out all year, and it doesn't really matter. Well, this is just an idea. This is just looking at um, 
a cabbage system. Early in the season, what has been found to work, and, and most people don't do this, but I think it would be nice to kind of look at that, is applying this a liquid formulation, okay, the seedlings, okay, and that will, will protect the seedlings because that's a very susceptible time and you can't always count on the snails and slugs to go and eat a bait. So, so apply, doing a liquid formulation has really great coverage, right? Okay, as the plants grow up, okay, you want to have good coverage again, but you really need to stop them from feeding and reduce that population. So the sand base, that would be something like, um, oh shoot, I can't remember the formula, slug or snail. Shoot, I can't remember. There's a really good snail bait, about 7.5% metaldehyde in there. Pellets, that's when you go with your normal stuff, you know, and just, just put that out there. It works really well. And then late in the season with cabbage, what happens is that a lot of times once that head starts developing or, or you get, you know, these sort of leaves can get oppressed to the inside, the snails and slugs, particularly slugs actually, will start hiding in there, okay? So you might not see a lot of damage but you, you might get that population living in there, in this, this area. So that's when that bait is really, really good. Your choice of bait is to get them out of that, that, that from the inside of that cabbage or that plant. And so you do that. It's not so much for control, although it will control, but it's getting the, those um, pests out of that cabbage, and then you can harvest, and hopefully you'll have a clean harvest. So, so that's just an idea about thinking about uh, you know, I know that we don't do this in the, in the ornamentals industry because that's not really the way the, the crops operate, but just, just an example to show that how you can, how the change of what you're going to be using, even though it's all metaldehyde, how that formulation change can actually increase um, crop safety or, you know, the marketability of the crop. And final message is that there's a lot of formulations out there Sometimes um, adult snails will feed on the bait more than those little neonates, those little tiny ones that's just as they're hatching. Um, so if you got a lot of them, they not, may not be going to the bait um, size of the, the snail and slug and you know, whether it's mature and reproducing or not. So a lot of those things really can change the, um, you know, how well you can expect that, that material to work in any situation. So, um, with that, I'm going to, if I could get the lights here, thank you. Um, I will entertain any questions, if anybody has anything really quickly, if you're all kind of done buzz. Um, yeah, and the, um, the parasitic nematodes, uh -huh. I mean, it sounds like if we were able to get something registered here, it would, it would be a good partner with pesticides. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, so, okay, go on. Is, is that, is that going to happen at some point, you think? If, if there is one, see, the, the issue with the one that's in, in Europe, you know, obviously, is that the U.S. won't let that one come in until it's found in the United States, right? Because they're afraid of what's going to happen to native populations. Um, but... Um, and so your question is, do I really think that there's going to be some kind of biocontrol? You know, that's what Rory's doing. He's going all over the place, and I've seen him, I've seen the stuff under the scope, and there are nematodes in, and, and somebody else I'm working with also, almost every snail they pick up, there's some kind of nematode in there. Um, so it's, it's a good possibility, but, you know, it's like one of those things, you just got to keep hunting and hunting and hunting until you get that um, nematode in a haystack, you know, as it were. Okay. Yeah, um, obviously, obviously, I've got a horse in this race. Yeah. I didn't pay for this study, but um, Mohammed Bari, the artichoke research guy, is going to present a paper next week, um, the first real hardcore resistance study, mm -hmm. and not be controlled for source population. So snails that have been acclimated, or slugs have been acclimated versus slugs that haven't been acclimated, and he controlled for size of the mm -hmm. test subjects. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so I'm going to go be the devil's advocate on that and say for something to be truly resistant, it has to be heritable. So I would say that he would have to have the snails breed and show that their, their offspring are resistant on that. So I'm, until I see that, I would not, I, I'm still skeptical, or slugs, either way. But until I see, see that there is some heritable 
um, activity of resistance, then I'm, I'm still, you know, I believe it when I see it, but, but until that happens, I still find it difficult. Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay, great. Thank you, Jim. Good job. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay.